When you think of gothic horror, what comes to mind? Maybe it's an old stone castle that's home to gargoyles or a werewolf howling under a full moon. It could be a vampire lurking around a dark corner in an old city, waiting for its next victim. Either way, monsters, murders, and darkness are all symbols of gothic literature. But how do they become characters in a story? And what goes into writing a story within the genre? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Emma with Servicescape, and welcome to the first episode of Write On. Today I'm going to share some tips on writing gothic horror that will forever haunt your readers. In the best way possible, of course. To understand how to write a gothic horror story, you first have to look at the roots of the genre. Famous gothic works like Bram Stoker's Dracula, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, and Shirley Jackson's The Lottery are perfect examples. These stories were all written years apart, with publishing dates ranging from the early 1800s to the late 1940s, and are still read and discussed to this day in classrooms across the U.S. But what makes them so memorable? And what do they have in common? The answer? Natural philosophy. Some of the best gothic fictions, like Frankenstein and Dracula, were created during a precursory period of what is now called modern science. Natural philosophers sought to find truth through objective reasoning and logic, and searched for solid answers about the unknown using the lens of science. Because of their approach, topics like the undead and the afterlife became central themes in many gothic stories. Many speculate that Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein to better understand death and to grieve over the death of her first child. One of her diary entries two years before she started writing Frankenstein read, Dreamt that my little baby had come to life again, that it had only been cold and that we rubbed it before the fire and it lived. Awake and find no baby. For Shelley, Frankenstein, which is centered around life, death, and the gray areas in between, came from a very personal and very human place. That same humanity drives many gothic stories. It goes to show that the source of horror in the story doesn't have to be mind-shatteringly unknowable to be scary. Lovecraftian horror, for example, relies heavily on the immense terror of the unknown. Novels in the genre focus on the fear of dangerous, forbidden knowledge, and the monsters that are capable of driving someone to insanity just by looking at them. They deal with subjects and influences that are outside of human control, as well as the dread that comes with facing the concept of humanity's cosmic unimportance. <laughs> Gothic horror, on the other hand, aims to seek out tangible ways to attain knowledge and understanding, and by extension, understand the antagonist, regardless of how human or inhuman they are. This brings us to our first tip. Set up some rules and stick to them. In a Gothic horror story, Antagonists are all about rules, both physically and morally. They have strengths and they have limitations. A classic example of this type of character building can be found in vampires and werewolves. In most stories, werewolves transform when the moon is full and can only be killed with a silver bullet, while vampires burn in the sunlight and can only drink human blood. Both are often depicted as suffering from diseases, adding a hint of human vulnerability to the otherwise supernatural. They have very clear physical rules that they follow throughout the story. This same rule-oriented character building should be applied when defining your antagonist's moral beliefs as well. Their actions could be defined by the need to accommodate physical needs or could be something more personal. Your antagonist could seek revenge like Frankenstein's monster after he was shunned by his creator. If your antagonist is a killer, maybe there's a who, what, when, and where to why they kill. The possibilities are endless. That being said, don't be afraid to find an antagonist where you would least expect them. They could be the narrator, a group of people with similar beliefs, or even the protagonist working against themselves. Which brings us to our next tip, exploring archetypes. Jack Skellington from The Nightmare Before Christmas is a perfect example of this. In the film, he fills several archetypes. He's the narrator, the hero, and the villain all in one. His taking over Christmas starts with good intentions that ultimately become harmful. But he only makes things right after he comes to the realization himself, despite his friends warning against his actions. Jack is interesting because he isn't exclusive to one archetype. Instead, he's a mixture of three. Archetypes like the hero and the narrator are commonly found in Gothic literature, but aren't necessarily cliches. 
Typically, heroes are driven by virtue or ambition. They seek knowledge, love, or friendship, and they're motivated to pursue these things. In Frankenstein, both the creature and Victor are heroes from their own perspective. The contrast between them allows the reader to sympathize with both, which creates an interesting narrative. Think of the creature's need for compassion and understanding versus how his appearance prevents that. And on the flip side, consider how Victor's creation of the creature prevents him from being with the love of his life. The sage archetype also shows up in gothic horror, often through members of the clergy or anyone seen as spiritual. These characters tend to know what the protagonist fails to see from the get-go. Think of Sally from The Nightmare Before Christmas, who's the only one questioning Jack's plan right from the start. Or the superstitious peasants at the beginning of Dracula who bless the main character out of fear at the beginning of the story. These characters exist as a manifestation of faith, whereas the protagonist is seen as a manifestation of reason, even if their judgment is flawed. So now that we have a setup, what comes in between? Well, that's entirely up to you. But by the end of your story, readers should have questions, and by extension, you need to have answers. You have to give your readers the chance to either see their questions about the main plot answered by the end, or provide them with enough clues throughout the story to figure it out themselves. Most importantly, these answers, like the rules they came from, should be logical. Take Shirley Jackson's The Lottery as an example. Early on, Jackson paints a picture of a small, seemingly normal town. There are children gathering piles of rocks after school and locals gossiping, but that illusion of mundanity is broken down slowly as tensions rise, and eventually readers learn why this is a lottery the townsfolk don't want to win, and also why those children have so many rocks. Once again, answers are given where answers are due. There's no unknowable or incomprehensible horror that leaves the reader bewildered like there is in Lovecraftian horror. Rather, the core of the horror within the story is logical and understood by the reader at the end. That brings us to our next point, the use of a smaller setting. Smaller settings like the community in the lottery are used to isolate the horror of the story, making it feel more claustrophobic and more lonely. But having a small setting doesn't necessarily mean the geographical span of your story has to be limited. Rather, the focus at the heart of your gothic fiction should be central to the relationship between the protagonist and the antagonist. This closeness can be seen in Frankenstein, where Victor is haunted by the creature after abandoning him. The creature is there, lurking and looming over his bed and watching him through windows. And the reader realizes that no matter where Victor is, the creature will follow. In Dracula, the protagonist has dinner with the Count before knowing he's a vampire. As the evening progresses, he's close enough to see the warning signs. The Count's skin is cold to the touch, and his teeth and ears are pointed. This closeness makes a threat more immediate to the protagonist, thereby raising the tension within the story. The last thing to keep in mind is the use of sensational and supernatural elements within gothic fiction. Each of the works we've mentioned so far have some sort of danger within them be it a murderous monster or a questionable community tradition. On one hand, you have a supernatural oddity at the heart of your horror, and on the other, you have human beings. These two threats are vastly different, but nonetheless written to be dangerous in their own ways, and they effectively show the range of horror that the genre is capable of. Your antagonist can be a creature or a monster, but it can also be an ideology, or an odd phenomenon, or a mixture of both. The only requirement is that, whatever the horror is, it can be understood. As the saying goes, the best way to overcome fear is to face it. And that's what the genre is all about. In the end, there are no hard rules to writing a gothic horror. But studying and understanding the elements of storytelling that make the masterwork so successful is a good place to start. Much like gothic heroes of the past, we as writers must also aim to understand what moves the plot forward in order to pursue our goals. And now that we know how to address the supernatural and sensational, and how the story and its characters have rules to follow and answers to find, we're one step closer. But if you're ever stuck, you can always turn to the imagery that inspired gothic writers of old. Monsters, murders, darkness, and the search for answers with the hope of understanding. Thanks for watching! If you'd like to see more of these videos, be sure to like and subscribe to our channel. We have more content coming very soon. See you next time.